Welcome to a brand new season of the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Now, our mission is to shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities we call home. Joining us in our season seven premiere episode is Rocky Mountain House Councillor Len Phillips. Rocky Mountain House is well known as the place of where adventure began with the story of the Rocky Mountain House trading fort and David Thompson. The highway dedicated in his name passes through some of the most beautiful scenery in Western Canada and is still the place of where adventure begins. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning, if you don't mind, and ask you a simple question to kick off our season seven. And that is the same question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Len? You know, that's that's a really good question. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure you heard a, a varying amount of, of different answers. But I, whenever I borrow something from somebody, I always like to bring it back in better shape than when I took it. So for me, municipal politics is no different. When I took office, uh, this is my second term that I'm in, so I'm in year seven of my term. I want to leave the community in a better place than when I first took office. That's that's my goal is to is to make it better and and to listen, you know, to 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 listen to what people have to say, uh, to give people a voice that sometimes may not be heard. Uh, I just I just want to be there to and you probably heard this statement a lot of times, but I, I want to make a difference. I actually want to make a difference. I want to do what's best for the people of Rocky Mountain House. So joking aside, do you want to borrow my lawnmower? Because it's currently broken. If you want to fix it before you give it back to me, that'd be greatly appreciate it. You know, that's probably the question you should have asked my dad because he was much more uh, much more better at fixing lawnmowers than I was. But, uh, you know, it, all joking aside, that that's that's my philosophy. That's the way I do life. Uh, I just want to make things better than when I when I first took office. Was that instilled upon you at a young age? Because you talk about your father. Was your father and yep. mother instrumental in giving that sort of sense of you give back to your community? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My, you know, my dad was a, a volunteer uh, when he, as I was growing up, uh, you know, he had some some challenges working in the in the military with some accidents that he had. But even, you know, even through some of the physical uh, challenges that he had through from, from accidents, he was always there to give. Uh, as was my mom, you know, my mom, it's it just something we've not really brought up in, but I saw that growing up and it was, it was instilled in me. And it's something that I still uh, want to see today. And I you know, would encourage my kids and, and anyone else just giving is receiving. Anytime you can give to, to someone, it it's, it's not just good for the community. It's good for yourself. It's good for everybody. So where did the desire to run municipally come from? Because I can't I can't imagine for someone like yourself, because I did a little bit of research on you, you seem like a meticulous guy who likes to plan things out, particularly in your other work as well. You don't just randomly wake up in uh, 2017 and say, I'm going to run for municipal council. Where did that desire to give back through the municipal lens come from? You know, you're right. It, 
you know, going back 10 years ago, if, if you had said, well, you're going to be a, you're going to be a politician someday, I would have said, no, you're, you're completely wrong on that. Uh, but it, you know, as, as through anything in life, uh, we evolve, we change. And, and to me, I, I saw an opportunity to, to come onto council and to give back to the community. You know, I, I, I love this community. I've been here for, uh, forever. Uh, it's it's the uh, it's the longest place that I've lived in in my entire life, and I've lived in many many different places. And you know, I I saw that opportunity, and I thought, you know what? Although I'm scared and I'm nervous, and I'm really it it takes a lot to put your name out and potentially have that rejection. Uh, I did it, and honestly, you know, it's challenging and at times stressful, like any any job is, but it's rewarding as well. You know, so it, it's one of those things that that I I actually am fulfilled doing this. So you bring up a good segue, and I wasn't going to talk about this until later on, but I want to play in the sandbox for a few seconds, if you don't mind here, mm -hmm. Len. You are, we are now in the, uh, what some eloquently call it, the silly season of municipal politics here in the province of Alberta. Because in one year time, the unofficial start of the election season, 2025 election period, begins. Yes. What advice would you have wished you would have known back in 2017 when you put your name on the ballot that you would want people thinking about putting their name on the ballot this year to know? So probably my biggest thing would be look at your time schedule because time commitment is is very important in municipal politics. People think, you know, you go to a couple of council meetings a, a month and and that's it. No, there's there's many hours of preparation before the meetings, during the meetings, uh, the committees we sit on, uh, not to mention all the conferences we go to. So time commitment is a big thing uh, to have people look at that. Talk to their families, uh, because this isn't just a Len thing. This is a family thing. When, when I go out to the grocery store, my wife knows that it's not just going to be as simple as picking up milk. There's, there's going to be conversations that happen there and, and, and the family has to be prepared for that. So, you know, time-wise, family-wise, and, and what is your reason behind it? What, what is, is motivating you to do it? Is it easy to strike that balance? Because I can imagine, particularly in Rocky Mountain House, which I've had the pleasure of visiting a few times, it's, mm -hmm. it's a relatively small urban city, but it's a town. It's the town of Rocky Mountain House. Yeah. Do you get a sense that you have to balance when Len is counselor and when Len is dad and husband and just family guy and just relax at home? Because I can imagine in a small town, you leave your house. You don't know if you're going to be stopped at the grocery store or stopped at a restaurant or even during your work days, if you're going to be stopped and asked questions about what's going on in the, the community and you're not doing that job. But in their eyes, the people, you are doing that job because that's what they've yes. elected you to do, a full-time job with part-time pay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, <laughs> correct. Uh, so you're right. Um, a, a council job isn't isn't a part time gig, for for uh, lack of a better term. You're there all the time. Uh, you're on twenty four seven, and whether it's going to the grocery store, whether it's going to a community event, uh, I was in the bank today, and and I had someone question me, you know, about council things in the bank. So you know, I never know where it's going to come from and who it's going to come from. Uh, but it's always good to hear from the from the public and to to listen to what they want and what they have to say because that's that's ultimately what I'm here for is to does listen it, to the public. Does it get easier to under. balance that? I'd like to say yes. <laughs> it gets easier. It, it's a challenge sometimes for sure, uh, especially you know when it comes to time because in in a lot of cases most people are are time poor, and uh, you know and and coming up with enough hours in the day to get everything done is, is a challenge sometimes. So, and that's why, you know, anyone thinking of running, that's the first question I would say is what is, what is your time commitment look like? And, and what, what may, you may need to um, remove from your time commitment now in order to make time for council. So you, you said it at the beginning of the interview, you were elected in 2017, reelected in 2021. You're in your seventh year going into your quote unquote eighth year. Um, I can imagine sitting around that table 
the decisions you have to make are quite hard because you are impacting people's day-to-day -day lives with the decisions yes. you make. They often say federal government is where the money is, provincial government is where they pass all the issues to, and the municipal is where you literally hit the ground running and try to solve the day-to-day -day issues. When you're sitting around that council table, how important is it for you to be open, to be just not ingrained in a way that you're going to vote or how you view an issue but when people come in you have to be open to hear about the issues that are they're talking about the financial challenges that they're dealing with because you pass a budget which impacts them daily is it important yes. for you to be a, a fluid in some sense it on the decisions you're making yes uh being open and again if i could speak to anyone that's thinking of running for for any type of council position you have to be open to new ideas new facts and new ways of doing things uh you know i, I have my own personal opinions of course like anybody else and uh, and i do bring those to the table so when having said that i always need to be open to having my mind changed because that is what a true uh, a true leader can do is is you can look at all the all the information look at all the data and say you know what i thought this is the way i was going to vote but based on what i'm seeing here and based on the discussion i've had i'm going to change the way that i'm going to vote because it's in the best interest of the community so is it is that challenging though because i i, I often quote spock from star trek Rathacon on this show so i apologize for anyone who's heard this quote but the needs of the, there you go the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one Mm -hmm. you being there for seven years you and I, i've watched rocky mountain council meetings there are some times where you have a bunch of people attend council meetings but on average i would say that's probably not as packed as it would have been 20 50, 20 30 years ago so when you hear people how do you weigh the person who's talking to you with the needs of the community because one person might be suffering but you know the information you gather from administration it could benefit a lot more people than that one. Is it challenging to weigh those two sides of every potential scenario that comes in front of you? Of, of course, for sure it is. Uh, because no matter no matter what decision we make on something, there's always someone that's going to love the decision I made, and there's always someone that's going to hate that decision. You don't and say. That's... You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> and and that is the 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 joy of municipal politics or any type of politics is taking all that data, taking the the conversations I have with people and even people that come to prevent to present to council, I need to take all of that, weigh it and decide what is the best decision for the town of Rocky Mountain House. Not the best decision for council, not the best decision for Len Phillips. What's the best decision for the town of Rocky Mountain House? And do we get it right all the time or do I get it right all the time? No, I, I wish I could say I did. Uh, but in, in, I do my best and I'm always there to be hearing what could be done better because there's always a better way of doing things. In municipal politics, it's hard to admit you're wrong because you know the people you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. You just said you don't get it right 100% of the time, which <laughs> no one ever does. When you do make that decision, though, how important is it for you to go out and communicate what the decision was from your standpoint? Because... Most people, and I say this with, I hate to paint a broad stroke, but I'm going to, most people don't tune into day-to-day -day decisions. They just get their tax bill mm -hmm. or they just read the newspaper and they go, what's going on? How important is yeah. it for you to go out and sell that vision that council has passed or even you have voted on saying, well, yes, I did vote for this or I did not vote for this and this is why, but council has decided that this is the path forward. It's very important. Uh in fact, it's probably one of the most important things we need to do as counselors is is to convey to the public what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, in in the era of social media and the amount of misinformation that can be put out on social media, and uh, you know, for lack of a better term, the keyboard warriors that that will uh, doubt every decision that's made. And, and put their own spin on it. It's very important that council gets the message across. Here's the decision we made. Here's the reasons why we made it. Here's the benefits for it and, and push that out. And even if it's a decision that I may have voted against, once the decision's made, that's a decision of council and that needs to be pushed forward. 
whether I voted for or against it. And that's and that's what I would hope that that every councillor would be able to do is, you know what, I may not have supported this decision when it got to the vote, but now that it's a decision of council, I need to support it. My last question before we turn to Rocky Mountain House as a whole, and mm -hmm. that is, in the last year, during these conversations that I've had, I've often asked about the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays, or I should say, should be playing. The mm -hmm. reason I say should be playing is because you have probably stopped at the grocery store and been asked about provincial issues or federal issues, whether it be healthcare, education, a war across the country that doesn't really impact people, but it does because it's on the national news. How often are you getting those municipal concerns raised to you in Rocky Mountain House? Or are you seeing a blurring of jurisdictional lines and they'll talk to you about provincial issues or federal issues because you're the closest to the person and they probably know you more than they know their MLA or their MP. You're you're absolutely right on that point. Uh, when it comes to provincial and federal politics, our, the MP and our MLA aren't here. They're not in our grocery stores. They're not here at public events. Uh, I am. So I will get those questions fielded to me and and people don't understand the difference between municipal, federal, and provincial politics. They just see it as politics. So when there's a problem with, you know, with homelessness, they they want uh, the council to deal with that, even though that's a provincial and federal issue, the council, I'm the one that's standing in front of them. It's not our MLA and it's not, not our MP, it's me. So they want me to make a decision and me to do something about it. And that's where the, the educational piece comes in as to what we can do as municipal councillors and municipal council versus our provincial and federal counterparts. But how, because I can imagine you don't want to just tell somebody that's not my responsibility, go talk to your MP or MLA. You probably want to actually sit there and okay, I will follow up with our MP or MLA. Oh, yes. How often do you find yourself talking to other levels of government about <laughs> issues that they have you have heard at the grocery store? A lot. A lot. Uh, you know, we we attend events in our community and as does our MP and MLA do come to these events. And it's it's very important to have good working relationships, working relationships with them, say that 10 times fast, uh, because if you don't have that relationship, those those messages cannot get conveyed well. So thankfully, I do have a good relationship with both our MP and MLA. And and I can have open, honest, frank conversations with them about things that community or concerns to not just Rocky Mountain House, but sometimes it's provincial and federal. So it, it's nice to be able to have those communication topics uh, because you don't get a lot of time with them. And when you do get the time, you've got to be able to make sure you've got your top three or five things that you want to hit them with. And and when the residents are bringing up things, then I can start seeing a theme. Okay, this. This one topic isn't just one person that's saying it, there's numerous. So this is something I need to bring up and have a conversation. So that's a perfect transition into the next segment. And I want to talk about the town of Rocky Mountain House as a whole. And as I do before any of this uh, segment starts, I preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of councillor. This is the uh, the opinion of the councillor that is on the interview. That being said, it may line up with some of the things that are going on in council, but it may not. If you have emails, please send them to me and I will file them away in the appropriate location. <laughs> that being said, counselor, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest challenges or challenge facing Rocky Mountain House today as of recording this interview? So uh, there's, a, there's a few challenges for sure. Probably one of the biggest one is uh, Inflation, as much as it's hitting, you know, the individual families and individuals throughout our country, it's also hitting municipalities too. So we are trying to uh, provide the same level of service in with realistically less dollars. Uh, the provincial, you know, grants that are coming down aren't as aren't as uh, plentiful as they once were. Uh, when I when I first became a municipal politician, to do a block of road was about roughly about eight hundred thousand dollars. Well, now in today's dollars, that's about, it's almost pushing $2 million. The The tax base has not increased 100% in that time frame. So we're trying to do 
the same level of service with realistically less dollars, which is very, very challenging. And I know that's facing every municipality now is how how can we do things that we've normally done because, you know, keeping keeping the toilets flushing and keeping the rec centers open, that's a municipal job. Getting the potholes fixed, uh, you know, that that is everything that we do. And how can we do it when we're giving we have less dollars to do it with? It's it's quite challenging. So as they we're recording this, we're in September. Traditionally, yeah. or I shouldn't say traditionally, but hypothetically, I've been through a few of these budget cycles. This is the start of the budget cycle for many municipalities in the province of Alberta. With that just being said, infrastructure challenges, which is you're not the first and you are probably not the last person to say this on that this show. Is this going to be a tough year for Rocky Mountain House while you're looking at what you need to do to continue to grow while we still have high inflation rates? So, yes. Um, I mean, it's always a challenging year uh, when, when we start talking, especially when we start, start going into budget season. Uh, you know, we, we have our service level review coming up here next month. And in that, we look at every service that we provide as a municipality and we look at it saying, is it something that's mandated by the MGA? Yes, we have to do it. Is it something we do over and above? Yes, we are, we're doing it. But what level do we have to do it at? And those decisions drive budget. That's what that's what actually creates the budget. So service level is what we do in November. Budget comes in December. But it's it's definitely challenging for sure because the uh, we're we're just doing less uh, with less dollars. We're trying to keep the same level of service and in the new post covid era whatever however you want to determine that we're starting to see a lot of social issues uh, homelessness addictions mental health issues that previously 10 years ago or 20 years ago weren't municipal issues but because it's becoming such a dominant topic people again they don't see their mp in the mla in the grocery store they see me and they're saying, what are you doing about homelessness? What are you doing about addictions? What are you doing about mental health? And from a municipal point of view, we don't have the budget to deal with that. That That is not something we have, but we're being asked to do it. So that is something we're trying to balance and advocate the provincial and federal governments to, to help us out and partner with us because it's not something that municipalities have the uh, dollars or the capacity to do. So I, I want to just pick up on that for a second, if you don't mind here, Councillor, mm -hmm. because you're, you're right. Post-COVID municipalities are dealing with a lot more than they were dealing with prior to it. And I say that with this caveat, more, more rural urban, which Rocky Mountain House, I would consider more rural urban because you're not Calgary, you're not Edmonton, you're not Red Deer. You are away from the beaten path in some sense. Did you see that that sort of change in sort of attitude in the community when COVID was going through, like from pre-COVID to now where you're going, we're not dealing with this. And then all of a sudden you just woke up one day and I shouldn't say one day, but it just, there was a light switch and you went, oh, we have to deal with this. This is not just an Edmonton or Calgary issue anymore. It's a Rocky Mountain yep. issue. It's a sundry issue. It's an old issue. You're right. Uh, these aren't just a Rocky issue. I, I would you know, it's it's something that I I truly believe that we're in a societal shift right now. That that we are, you know, as as we saw in the '60s and the '70s, you saw different societal shifts. I I firmly believe that COVID has got us in the middle of a societal shift right now. How that's going to play out in the end, I don't know yet because obviously we're in the middle of it. But the you know the average anxiety level of of a citizen, the average. Um, mental health is has changed people are much more anxious they're much more aggressive uh and and not trusting especially of government you know right. and and that that is a spillover unfortunately from some of the u.s style politics that we see that, that get brought into canada so it's much more difficult to uh to engage the public and have them feel that we're being genuine because there's that that distrust that's that's been created and it, it's something that is really really um becoming more and more prevalent and there's just there's more anxiety and more um angst you amongst think, the residents how is the engagement at rocky mountain house would you say that 
if you put out a request for information or, hey, how do you think we're doing as a council or how do you think we should be spending our budgetary money this year? Will people actually give you their honest feedback via social media, via the website? Or do you actually have to go out in front of people and actually ask them that question? Because engagements to, in today's world where everyone is busy, do you find that there is engagement in Rocky Mountain House or do you think you could do better? We can always do better. There's no question about that. Uh, surveys are valuable to us for sure. We have to be be careful that we don't um, do survey burnout by asking too many questions because then when you do have important questions, uh, you know, the residents are like, oh, I've, I've answered these 50 times over. I'm not doing this one. So there's a fine line between asking and asking too much. But to, to answer your, your question before, it's very important that we get out in the public and talk to the residents one-on-one, -on -one. you know, talking to our seniors, uh, talking to our young, uh, young up and coming residents. What are your challenges? What do you need? Uh, having those questions answered in a frank open discussion can help us in our budget deliberations for sure. So I want to flip back for a second because we went off on a tangent there and that was my fault. I apologize. I just like to talk about engagement, but I want to talk about the issues again for a second before we talk about the things that you're proud about with your community. Um, you've gone through, I would say, two budget cycles since the COVID pandemic. Yes. Uh, we're sort of on the tail end, but who knows how long the tail end is actually going to last of COVID. <laughs> um, do you get a sense that you guys have struck a right balancing of being able to balance the social issues that you weren't dealing with co uh, prior to COVID with the challenges that you were dealing with prior to COVID and being able to find a sort of sweet spot to be able to address the issues of your community when it comes to council budgets, when it comes to bylaws, when it comes to the day-to-day -day issues that are faced in front of your community. So one one positive thing or very good thing we have going through and with the town is looking at our 10-year capital plan because we have a we have a 10-year capital plan in place. And the amount of money we have in reserves today and the amount of money we have in reserves 10 years from now will be the same and we will have accomplished all of the capital projects that we need to accomplish at that time. So that is a very, very uh, fortunate thing. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not speaking for other municipalities, but I know that's a challenge for some municipalities for sure, especially the smaller ones. Uh, the uh, keeping up with the infrastructure is very, very difficult. So having said that, you know, we we are in a very strong financial position in the, in the town of Rocky Mountain House. So that's that's this council and previous councils that have all led up to this. Uh, plus, our administration is is very is phenomenal. We've got a very very experienced uh, administration team and a very experienced CAO. So we are able to do that. Having said that, um, there is no money for the social uh, the social aspect of things. Uh, there's always money from federal and provincial governments for capital projects, you know, when it comes to potentially doing addiction centers and things like that, but there's never any money for the operational part of it. And as anybody knows, the operational part of it is forever and ever and ever. The capital is a one-shot deal once it's built, but then also that, that asset gets turned over to the municipality who now is responsible to maintain that for, in perpetuity. So, Coming up with the dollars to operationally fund social issues is probably the biggest problem that we're having as municipalities. There just isn't money. So we Would need you, to be can talking. I, can I, can I jump in there? Because I want yeah. I just want to interject on that for a second. And I apologize for interrupting, but I hate to do that. But do you get a sense that the community wants you to do that, though? Because finding the money and in, injecting that money into social issues is one thing. But if the community doesn't rally behind the ideas or the approach that council wants to take on addressing the social issues, you, you might be throwing money at bad, sort of bad scenarios here. Mm -hmm. So do you get a sense that when you get that idea of how you want to proceed on social issues with the limited funds that the municipality may have, the, the community will say, yes, let's do it. And because we do need to address it. So in, you know, in talking with the nonprofits and talking with our residents in town, uh, there, there's no doubt that there's a need, uh, especially post-COVID, where we're finding those that need has exploded after COVID. The problem is who, who pays for it? 
that's that's the magic question is who pays for it uh as municipalities we you know traditionally roads rec centers swimming pools making sure your water turns on and off and toilets flush that's the role of municipalities uh through AB Muni's, uh, I know we've been advocating the province heavily on social issues. Uh, in fact, at our last AB Muni's conference, the town of Rocky Mountain House put together uh, some uh, resolutions on homelessness and, and things like that to bring to the forefront that these aren't just Edmonton and Calgary problems. We have these problems in Rocky and Sundry and Drayton Valley and, and you name the other, other municipalities. It's a problem everywhere. And I think people are starting to see it now that, you know, the the tent populations that pop up in the cities also pop up in small communities. They're just a little better at hiding them sometimes in smaller communities. So the issues are there and the problems are there. Unfortunately, the money isn't there to deal with it. And that's where, the you know, having the relationships with our MLAs and our MPs is very important because how else do we do this we need, we have to partner with the province and the federal government if we're going to make any type of meaningful uh forward progress on it so i want to flip the script a little bit and i want to talk about the things you're proud about and the accomplishments of rocky mountain house you already talked about one of the 10-year capital plan yep. but what are some of the other things that when you look at your community and every community has its challenges i don't care who you are from the largest to the smallest we all have our challenges but there's always unique things that we're proud about our own communities What's that for you? What are those things that you look at and you say, you know what, we're doing this right? So uh, one thing that I, I've been part of since the beginning was uh, we we have a recycling program and, and an organics program in town right now. So all of this has been in preparation for uh, EPR that's coming up, which is Extended Producer Responsibility, uh, which is in essence making producers responsible for the end of life of their product. And uh, prior to this, we, we had garbage pickup and that was it. Well, now we have organics program, we have recycling, we have garbage pickup. And this was all in anticipation of EPR, which is coming now in April of 2025. So we will start seeing the benefits of having these programs in place because now it's up to uh, the producers to deal with the recycling portion of the waste stream. So that's that's a big change. Uh, it wasn't, of course, it wasn't a smooth, uh, easy transition because you know the the public has to buy in as well because now they're sorting their waste and doing different things. So there was some definite hiccups at the beginning, uh, but now we're set and poised to see the the benefits of that. We also have a new wastewater treatment plant that's actually being built as we speak. Uh, that's hopefully going to be online sometime early 2025. We're anticipating that that's going to be online. Uh, again, a, a big, big, uh, a big project. It's a 30, 30 plus million dollar project, uh, which was partnered by the provincial and federal governments. And, you know, part of that was driven by the federal government because the regulations keep changing. So therefore the old lagoon system wouldn't work and we need to get a mechanical system in place. And, uh, but that's happening and that's going to, going to hopefully be ready by, you know, beginning of 2025 and Rocky, the, so Rocky has the Rocky Mountain his, historic site and just this last week celebrated 225 years of being around. Wow. So, you know, from a, fur, from a fur trading post of 225 years ago, we now have the, uh, the thriving community of Rocky Mountain House. So that's that's a big deal uh, that we've been around for that long. And for those who don't know, that's the Rocky Mountain House Fort. The, if I'm not mistaken, it's a federal historic uh, national park. If I'm not yes. mistaken, correct? It it is correct. Yeah, it's a <laughs> national historic site. So you, you bring up a good segue here into my last segment because I, we're about a half hour in, and I want to get into this topic because yes. it's dear, near and dear to me, and that is tourism. And now, like I said, mm -hmm. I've been to your community a few times, but I'm going to be coming back because you've come on my show, so I'm going to come back and visit the community spots that you're about to mention here. Okay. We all have great tourism spots. We just need to promote them a little bit better. What are some of the hot spots, the hidden gems in Rocky Mountain House that you say, if you come through this area, if you travel the Dave Thompson Highway, you need to stop and visit these locations? What's those for you? 
So obviously we just talked about one, the National Historic Site. Uh, that's a that's a treasure trove of of history. And uh, so at the at the National Historic Site, uh, there's everything from you know Buffalo are there. It's right on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River, and the the history from you know 1799 until today can be lived through that historic site. And right beside that historic site is it's called the Briarly Rapids, and they're Class Five rapids. So class five rapids that are easy and accessible to get to are rare to find. And we literally have them five minutes outside of town. So it's something that a lot of uh, kayaking and canoeing enthusiasts come from all over the province because you can literally put in, go down the rapids and there's a sandbar right beside it. And you can walk back up, redo them again. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a, quite an entertaining thing to see people do that. Uh, we have uh, Abraham Lake, which is you know just west of Rocky, and it is a glacier-fed lake. And in the summertime, it is as blue as blue can be. You you just can't imagine this color of blue. So a lot of people will come there in the summertime to see this lake because it's it's just gorgeous, surrounded by the mountains. And in the winter time, uh, they have methane bubbles in this lake. It it, it naturally produces methane bubbles. And because the water is so clear, you can literally see right down to the bottom of the of the lake, and you can see these methane bubbles that are huge, like they're they're quite quite large and quite interesting to see. Uh, there's quite a few tour buses that will come just to see the methane bubbles in the winter, not to mention the summer summer activities as well. Uh, you know, you look at anything outdoorsy, you can do minutes outside of our town. There's hunting, there's quadding, there's fishing, there's uh, hiking, you name it, cross-country skiing in the wintertime, anything that you want to do that's outdoors, Rocky Mountain House has that to offer. So just, I have to ask the Sophie's Choice question a little bit here, but after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, is there a spot that you can go and just decompress and recenter yourself? Yes, for sure. So, and again, this is about a <laughs> a 10, five, 10 minute walk. We have a waterfall in town right on the banks of the North Saskatchewan river. Uh, it's probably about a 30, 40 foot tall waterfall and it's right down beside our water treatment plant. And at the end of the day, my, my wife and I will take our dog and we'll just go down there and hang out and enjoy the waterfall that, that is in our town limits. Like it's, it's amazing to have something like that right inside. So I need to come back and see that for first off. I, I would I would be happy to take you there. <laughs> That's what I like to hear, Len. Um, so <laughs> before we like I let you go and I ask my last question. Um, as this is season seven, I've introduced a few new questions. And I did not prepare you for this, but these okay. questions are only for those who are actually in Alberta right now, because in a year's time, you're heading to an election. So I've got to mm -hmm. ask two terms down. Can we see Len Phillips uh, a name on the ballot in one year's time or is two enough? Uh, you will see my name on the ballot in one year's time for sure. Good to know. And then second question on top of that is at the beginning of the interview, you talked about leaving things better off than you got it. Looking back on your career so far, have you left Rocky Mountain House better off so far than you got it? You know, I mean... Uh... Obviously, the residents would be able to answer that better than I would. Uh, I would like to think that I have, that I've made a difference, and I've made uh, people's lives uh, better and and created more uh, recreational things and and better things for the for the people to do, better for the environment. So I would like to say yes, I think I've made a difference. And I would also like to say that i'm I'm not done making a difference. I think there's there's still more things I can do, more things I can accomplish. And uh, that's why you, you won't stop seeing this lovely face <laughs> from being around the municipal world. So I'm just going to interject here for a second and say the last time I was driving up to Rocky Mountain House, it wasn't the welcome to Rocky Mountain House sign that first welcomed me into the community. It was a big giant Len Phillips sign that was stationed there. So when you visit <laughs> Rocky Mountain House, you don't just get welcomed by the welcome sign, you get welcomed by Len Phillips as well. Uh, 
So there's my little joke to sort of uh, <laughs> change the subject here to my last question. So what makes the community of Rocky Mountain House such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, when I, uh, I in, in my previous life, I, I used to manage Zeller stores. So I got transferred around quite a bit. Uh, I used to manage the Zeller store in Rocky Mountain House uh, decades ago. And I had an opportunity to live in small towns, mid-sized cities, cities like Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver. I chose, when I had a chance to open up my own business, I chose to come back to Rocky Mountain House. I didn't have to think twice. It was just a natural decision. I wanted to come back here. I lived here. I loved the community. I loved all the amenities that we have. I loved the people. So it was, it was just a natural choice for me to come back. And I've been back here now for 30 years and I will spend the rest of my days here. I, I love this community and I'm passionate about it. Counselor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking 40 minutes out of your day and sitting down and chatting with me. It's always a pleasure to sit down and speak to municipal leaders from across this country. And I'm looking forward to visiting Rocky Mountain House and saying hi to you and hopefully we can go grab a coffee while we go out to the waterfall. I, I would love to have, have coffee and go out to the waterfall and show you all what the, the area has to offer. Thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. We hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders making a difference within their own community. Now, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to bring these important stories to you and others. So stay connected. Stay informed, and we'll see you next time on Cross Border Interviews. Until then.